The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Greetings, everyone. Thank you for taking the, the time to join our webinar. Today's topic is clinical research coverage analysis, what it is and why you need it. My name is Alyssa Greiner, and I will be your host today. I am joined by Tareem Ahmed, Senior Research Finance Specialist at Elego Health Research, and Paula Glanville, Research Finance Specialist at Elego Health Research. Today's webinar will run for approximately 45 minutes and will include a Q&A session with our speakers. Please feel free to submit questions throughout the course of the webinar through the chat box, and we will get to as many as time allows at the end. This presentation is being recorded and will be available on Elego's website following the event. Without further ado, I will hand it over to our speakers. Tareem and Paula, you may begin when you're ready. Thank you so much, Alyssa. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tareem, and I will be presenting clinical research coverage analysis um, with my coworker, Paula Glanville. A little introduction about myself. I've been in clinical research for seven years and have been doing analysis for studies ranging from cancer to pediatrics to all specialties. And now I would like to hand it over to my esteemed coworker, Paula Glanville. Thank you, Tareen. My name is Paula Glanville. As mentioned before, I'm a research financial specialist with Elego Health Research. I have our seven years of clinical research experience with six years of coverage analysis exper experience as well, uh, completing over 700 coverage analysis a year. And I'm here in Spokane, Washington. So I'd like to start it off. Train next slide, please. Today, we wanted to give you an introduction to coverage analysis and relations to coverage analysis to budgets and contracts, how building a coverage analysis, coverage analysis guidelines, the importance and impact. Next slide, please. So a coverage analysis is a key factor regarding compliance for clinical research studies. Coverage analysis is a review of the research study to determine if it is eligible to receive Medicare coverage, what is billable to Medicare, and outlines what items and services performed as part of the research study should be billed to Medicare. It identifies all clinical items or services associated with particular clinical trials, including identification of the financial account, account financially accountable parties, such as the sponsor, the funding source, patient, or third-party payers. And so questions that you need to ask if the study is qualifying, it meets the requirements for eligibility to receive Medicare benefits. Does the trial evaluate an item or service which, with, which is within the benefit category? Is it a drug or biological or device? Does the trial have therapeutic intent? Does the trial enroll patients with a diagnosed disease? Is the trial deemed? Is the trial found on clinicaltrials.gov? Does the study drug have an IND or an investigational new drug number or an IDE, which is an investigational new device number? So those are some of the five questions that you need to ask if you're trying to determine if clinical services are qualified by the Medicare or CMS standards. There are also seven other characteristics uh, for more detailed review. So the coverage analysis is a vital component to the study activation process and saves sites time and money and their reputation in the future. A coverage analysis can be known as a medical coverage analysis in MCA, you'll hear, or a billing grid, or coverage determination, or a billing BCA, billing coverage analysis. Next slide, please. So why do we need a billing for billing compliance, a coverage analysis? A coverage analysis ensures billing compliance 
because many institutes, sites, and hospitals have been audited by the FDA over the past years to find itch, issues such as double billing, which is incorrect, faulty medical documentation support, and more. Sites have been fined up to $3 million due to noncompliance. The punishment for violation of False Claims Act is up to three times the amount of the initial violation and an additional penalty for up to over $21,000 per violation. So in 2006, U.S. hospitals submitted $3 trillion worth of medical claims and $262 billion of those charges were initially denied. And 63% of the claims eventually recovered. However, it cost hospitals of the average of $180, $118 per claim to dispute or 8.6 billion total in administrative costs. So the time and effort and cost associated with improper billing can, can devastate an institution financially. Uh, recently fines of 22.7 million in a medical fraud billing case uh, was as recent as April of last year. So it's best to get it right from the start with Medicare coverage analysis. Next slide, please. So the relation of coverage analysis to budgets and contracts. How is coverage analysis related to our team? It's coverage analysis requires supporting documentation for accuracy. This coverage analysis is a neutral document that's built use, look, utilizing protocol, the ICF, which is informed consent and other documentation such as the IB, the investigational brochure, lab manuals, ECRFs, that can all be provided by the sponsor or the PI. Some institutes provide draft budgets and contracts in order to aid analysis when building coverage analysis. This can be helpful to determine what items are being paid for by the sponsor. So the analysis job is to double check that all of these items are marked as standard of care in the budget templates by, by applying CMS guideline, guidelines regardless of what the sponsor dictates. Okay, thank you so much, Paula, and I will be discussing how to build a coverage analysis. A coverage analysis is a complicated process, and it is definitely a game of perspective. It is highly dependent on the therapeutic area of the clinical research study. As you can see in this picture, a coverage analysis can be built in many ways. And therefore, our team ensures that we collaborate with sites, institutions, PIs, whoever is involved with the coverage analysis or the clinical study to ensure that we make a very accurate analysis. The way we make a coverage analysis is that we like to mirror the schedule of events of the protocol. And if you can see here, there's a snippet of Excel. We utilize um, Excel and multiple clinical trial management softwares or systems, such as Encore, Velos, Clinical Conductor. In this picture, I have a snippet of um, Excel. Here you can see we've titled the coverage analysis. The naming convention can vary. Um, this is the event name, which is essentially all the procedures that are listed in the protocol. Some institutes um, like to utilize CPT codes and they basically link that to the procedures and some of them like to give a range of CPT codes. If you go further down the right, here is the visits, the screening, cycle one day one, cycle one day 15, pretty much what we find in the schedule events of our protocol, but sometimes we like to be even more granular by adding other visits that may be hidden or something that we could find in the footnotes. Something that I want to look into or kind of highlight is the billing designation or the billing modifier, which is what tells us what is paid by who. For example, this R0 indicates that this is a research item. This item will be paid by anyone but CMS, which is Medicare and Medicaid. We don't want to pay this to anybody. The department, the sponsor, or whoever is funding the study will be responsible for this particular procedure. Whereas Q1 is routine care or standard of care, and these items can be billed to Medicare and Medicaid. 
Many institutes have different naming conventions for billing designations as well. For example, R0 could be considered as S or NB, Q1 can be considered SOC or M. Now, what is the use of coverage analysis or coverage determination? As discussed by Paula previously, that it assists in identifying financial responsibility. Who is paying for what item? It ensures research compliance. The goal of coverage analysis is to ensure that all research is conducted according to the highest ethical standards and in compliance with all applicable laws, rules, guidelines, and institutional policies. It is a comprehensive analysis of documents. It basically has the condensation of all the procedures and items that will be done in the study and condensation of the protocol. It is a tool to ensure compliant claims processing. We also utilize this for early detection of items and services that can be not covered. For example, if a institute has a research study that they want to fund for themselves, we call them departmentally funded or PI initiated, they like to um, submit a coverage analysis to us and we make that call that, hey, this is not all paid by CMS there are potential items that you will have to pay for or the patient will have to pay for. And lastly, it supplies CPT codes for maximum reimbursements. As mentioned before, CPT codes are sometimes used by institutes and the utilization of CPT codes makes sure that we get the maximum amount of money associated with that procedure that is listed. Now, what is the impact of coverage analysis? This document is utilized by multiple teams, namely the study team and the regulatory staff. The study team is our direct customer, our primary stakeholder. They utilize this document to help negotiate research dollar amounts for their budgets with the funding source. For the regulatory staff, they check for congruency among the protocol, the informed consent, and other supportive documents. We ensure that there is alignment of all these documents to make a seamless transition into activation. Another area that we have seen that some institutes utilize electronic health records, such as EPIC, and they utilize the coverage analysis for their own EPIC builds. Again, institutional compliance, we utilize this document for auditing purposes. It is utilized for clinical research billing, again, to identify who the appropriate pair is. And lastly, we like to use this for reconciliation of all the charges that are coming through. These are some references and resources that we utilize when we build coverage analysis. I wanted to highlight a few. For example, CMS.gov is where we find the NCDs and LCDs or any updated policies related to all procedures that are listed in a research study. Some items or that we like to review are the pharmacology of the uh, study. For example, if there's a therapeutic intent, we like to look up the drugs in Daily Med or Lexicom or any um, other website that is free to use for that institute. We like to utilize NCCN guidelines for cancer trials. So it basically lets us know the imaging and how many are considered standard of care. This is a reference that Paula basically um, overviewed about the false claim acts and fraud abuse laws. And lastly, this is our website, Elego Health Research, and this can let you know what our services entails when it comes to coverage analysis. And I would like to say that here at Elgo Health Research, we do pride ourselves in creating accurate and detailed coverage analysis to ensure compliance and a seamless activation for our studies. And for more information, please feel free to contact us. Thank you. And any questions? Yes, we will now move into the Q&A portion of today's webinar. We've already had a few questions come in, but please continue submitting questions via the chat box. The first question for our speakers is, what is a neutral coverage analysis document? I can take that. Uh, Paula here. It's a non-biased document. Uh, we can use it for auditing. Um, it's the source of truth for billing. 
so that the study team at any time can look at that document and say, we cannot bill that to the insurance. It has to be paid by by sponsor to avoid any double dipping that I mentioned earlier in the presentation um, of who pays for what. So it's a non-biased document. Wonderful, thank you, Paula. Our next question is, what is the difference between routine care and standard of care? I can take that question, the stream. That's a great question, actually. That is a very, um, very frequently asked question from study teams. So basically what routine care costs is, um, it is anything that can occur regardless of a clinical trial. Whereas standard of care is something that can be standard per a physician, whereas per CMS, it does not necessarily need to be standard of care. So standard of care is what is dictated by CMS, and that's how we figure out on the coverage analysis side if something can be built to CMS or not. I hope that answers the question. Great. Thank you, Tareem. We have another question here. What is CMS? I, I can also answer that. So that is um, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and that is our truth machine, basically. We looked up all our policies through cms.gov. Perfect. Thank you. And we just had another question roll in. Um, the attendee asks, I am always confused regarding NCD and LCD. Which one trumps the other? Is it local that holds precedence over the national coverage determination? What a great question, Paula here. Um, LCDs would trump NCDs. Do you disagree? And Tareem? Yeah, I agree. Yes. Great yeah, question. and just to kind of clarify, LCD is our local coverage determination and NCD is our national coverage determination. National is, of course, widespread local. For example, when we want to do a coverage analysis for a clinical trial that is located in the state of, let's say, Illinois, which is where I'm from, our NCD, our LCD would be different. So when you go to the CMS.gov, you can see we have multiple contractors and that can tell you, you know, depending on your location, what is standard of care versus what's not. Wonderful. Okay, it looks like that takes us to the end of our audience questions and thus concludes our Q&A session. If you have any other additional questions as our speakers mentioned, you're welcome to contact them. Thank you, Tareem and Paula, for the insightful presentation today, and we hope that everyone has a great rest of their day. Great, thank you. Thank you so much.